Are we live, Roger? We are live. Welcome, everyone. Welcome. Thanks, everybody, for joining. Um, we're just going to give it a, a minute or two as folks roll on here. Um, thank you for joining the Solar United Neighbors Solar and EV Charger Co-op Information Session. So let's hang tight for a minute, and then we'll get rolling. Roger, you know I started a practice session, right? Yeah, we are we are live. We have six folks here. All right. And the four of us. Excellent. Well, we will go ahead and get started. Um, is Dawn one of those folks by chance? No? No. All right. So again, we'll go ahead and get started. My name is uh, Benjamin Hoyne. I am the Virginia Program Director with Solar United Neighbors. Thank you again for joining us this evening. Um, this is our solar and EV charger co-op information session. We're gonna be here for about an hour. Um, we will have time for questions and we certainly encourage you to put your questions uh, in the chat. Um, Roger, uh, my distinguished colleague here with Solar United Neighbors will be monitoring the chat. Uh, also joined by Andrew Grigsby uh, with Viridiant, uh, who will be talking before too long, and Ruth Amundsen uh, with Norfolk Solar and Sunspots. And I uh, also wanted to let everybody know this webinar is being recorded, so that's great for you that you can watch this again at your leisure, or uh, if you have to cut out uh, or join late, uh, you'll be able to do that, and we'll be sending it out probably tomorrow. Uh, with a, a full link to the recording. You can certainly forward that on to your friends or, or family, what have you. Uh, we were going to be joined uh, by the City of Richmond uh, tonight. Uh, RVA Green, Don Oleski is the Energy Program Manager. We're really thrilled that the City of Richmond is a partner on the Solar Co-op in Metro Richmond. Um, but I'll just uh, skip through these slides real quick. Uh, maybe Don will get on board here before too long. Hey, Ben, uh, Carrie, Carrie said that uh, she is here from Enrico County. Oh, Carrie's here, wonderful. Um, Carrie, did you wanna just take a minute to introduce yourself? Uh, Carrie Webster with Enrico County. Let me, uh, let me see if I can make that happen. Okay, uh, Carrie should be rejoining in one second with the ability to, to talk and go on video. Wonderful. Sorry for the technical difficulties, folks. We'll be rolling on here in just a moment. Or should, there we go. Hey, Carrie, looks like you are hopping on. Thank you for joining us tonight. Um, never quite sure who's gonna be able to make it in the evening. It's a, it's always a challenge. Um, if you're able to turn your camera on and your microphone, uh, would, would love to turn it over to you just to talk about um, Henrico County Energy Management, uh, what you're doing and um, being part of this co-op. Not sure, not sure if you could hear me there, Carrie. It's like we got Dawn chiming in as well. Andrew, how about you take it away with Viridian and we'll get folks queued up here and then we'll we'll keep rolling. All right. Thanks. Uh thank you, Ben. Uh, so I'm with Viridian. We're a nonprofit based here in Richmond. I'm glad to be a partner on this co-op this fall. And been for a long time. We've been we've worked with the city and the county on a number of initiatives. 
and have uh, admired the work Ruth, Ruth is doing with Norfolk Solar. So we're really excited to be part of this. We have been around since 2006, offering a wide variety of green building services, uh, consulting and advising all as a, as a mission-driven nonprofit. And indeed, we've run the Solarize RVA com, uh, campaign here in Richmond for a few years. And our role for this uh, campaign this fall is really to help people uh, better understand sort of the full suite, as I might say, of clean energy opportunities in your home. Uh, solar is is one tool. It's a great tool. I have solar panels in my house uh, since 2017. Um but uh, my neighbor, for example, with their slate roof in poor condition and a giant oak tree, it's, they're not a good candidate, but they're a very good candidate for some efficiency improvements. Indeed, most homes are. I've been crawling around Virginia houses uh, for some decades, and uh, I can tell you there's a lot of opportunity out there. So we want more folks to not only investigate seriously the potential for solar on their homes, but also just find out how they can reduce the uh, electricity and gas demands of their home. And so a home energy audit, it's not an audit of the scary kind, it's an audit of the helpful kind of just really an inspection uh, from an expert who's not trying to sell you any particular solution. I'm not trying to sell you heat pumps or insulation or new windows or even solar. We're in there as independent experts to find the cost-effective solutions that meet your goals. Um, and we just want more people to take care of, take advantage of that opportunity. Prices start as low as 175 with, with a utility rebate. Um, the rebate actually pays us in, in hot water pipe wrap. Uh, and for example, I mean, the, the power of efficiency, I, I really can't, I can't overstate. I mean, as you see there at the bottom, uh, light bulbs and uh, pool noodles around your hot water pipes uh, often are worth uh, three uh, three solar panels. So uh, that's something you might want to investigate. Uh, you won't get three solar panels for $175. Next slide, please. So a home energy audit, again, it's really just an inspection, is to find opportunity uh, where ducts are leaking, where hot water pipes are uninsulated or maybe are leaking, where there's a lot of air leakage around the building is sort of shown in that bottom right-hand picture. Uh, the upper right-hand, that's, that's the main trunk line coming off an air handler in an attic that is just blowing hot air into the attic all winter long. Um, I find these things all the time. Next slide. So a home energy audit, it can be uh, as simple as just a quick walk around your home and giving you some ideas, or we can get into significant detail. We can do inspection, we can, we can do mechanical tests, measure how drafty the home is, measure the leakage of the ductwork. We can do combustion safety tests. We can do what's called an energy model, a sort of computer simulation of the home and give you cost benefit estimates of any number of, of upgrades for the home. We give you a written report and we're always here on the back end to help you uh, and, and look at bids, uh, understand better what's in the report, et cetera. Again, we're a mission-driven nonprofit just trying to really fight climate change by helping people improve their homes. Next slide. Um, and just this is just one little stat I wanted to show you all. You know, duct leakage is not nearly as interesting or fascinating as solar panels, but it matters so much. Uh, we did a study for the U.S. Department of Energy a few years ago on new homes, and we investigated new homes around the Commonwealth. And uh, what you see there is, is on that graph is 75% uh, of homes that were considered ready for final, ready to hand over to the occupant, did not meet the duct tightness threshold specified in our energy code, some dramatically so. Uh, so 
just some real basic things like going in and finding the leaks in a duct system can save you a ton of energy. Next slide, please. Uh, and real quick, um, there are you, you're you're going to get a, a lot about thirty percent tax credit on solar installations tonight. There's also uh, tax credits for energy efficiency investments, up to two thousand dollars for a new heat pump this year, up to two thousand dollars for a heat pump water heater, which is a super efficient electric tank water heater. Uh, there's thirty percent credits on doors, windows and insulation, uh, high performance insulation. So uh, next slide, please. <clears throat> and as maybe we'll come up later, there are tax credits for electric vehicle charging equipment and for the vehicles themselves. So there's uh, a lot of opportunity there, not only to invest in clean energy technology, but to look, get a little bit back on your taxes. And I'll be sticking around to answer questions as we go. And I'll hand it back to Ben. Great. Thanks, Andrew. And there's his contact information. Uh, we'll be sure to include that uh, in the chat. Uh, I see Dawn is with us. I'm sure juggling life like many of us are. But uh, Dawn, if you're able, uh, we got your slides queued up and I will turn it over to you. Thanks, guys. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, great. That was a, a very chaotic moment of technology jumbling, um, to, juggling to get to where I am. So I'm glad you can hear me. Um, just, uh, unfortunately, I can't see who's here. I'm on my phone in a car, but um, wanted to welcome everyone. Really grateful for this opportunity. As many of you know, we recently adopted our Climate Equity Action Plan, and there's a lot in there. When we did all the public engagement on, you know, what is the big priority um, where should we start with all of these 49 strategies? It was solar was within the top five. Um, residents want help with this. This is a big climate action and resilience and equity centered effort that we can all um, take part of. So if you want to jump to the next slide, I just have a couple here to show you guys. Yep. Um, you can see on this one. Uh, so on the, the buildings and energy, um, in terms of emissions, greenhouse gas emissions, buildings and energy make up 68% of Richmond's emissions. Of that, 22% comes from residential energy. And um, you can see 47% of our emissions come from electricity. So we have a lot of opportunity here. If you wanna jump to the next slide. Yep. Uh, so this plan, this RVA Green 2050, um, it's basically net zero emissions by 2050 and a 45% reduction by 2030. These are specific actions in the plan that we are prioritizing to um, alleviate energy poverty for our, um, you know, our communities and to help residents. So that's what this co-op is all about. If you go to the next slide. All right. Um, all of these efforts in the plan benefit um, our residents on many levels. So by taking part in a co-op, by it, um, researching solar and thinking about some of these new opportunities and taking on these trusted experts who just want to help, um, you're really doing more than just getting solar on your roof. Um, and these are some of the, some of the um, elements you'd be helping with. If you want to jump to the next slide. Yep. And this is just thanking all of you for being here and being ambassadors of Richmond's community-owned climate action and resilience plan. So I will kick it back to you, but just wanted to thank everyone for being here, including our speakers. Thanks, Don. Appreciate that. And Carrie, if you're able, feel free to turn your camera on. Happy to, to have you jump in as well. Um, otherwise, I will just uh, get rolling on. Um, there we go. All right. Carrie, take it away. It's a miracle. Sorry about that. I was locked up for like five minutes. My iPad did not want to be a panelist. <laughs> um, yeah, I just wanted to say hello. Um, thank you for inviting me. And um, as a part of the Metro Richmond area, uh, Henrico County is included in this effort. Um, my job as energy manager is to reduce energy and transition to renewable energy in county buildings. But I'm still um, wanting to be a resource to our community and to any home and business owners that are interested in this area. And I think this is a wonderful resource and a very 
um, trusted, low pressure way to learn about solar and whether you're a good candidate for solar. So thanks very much. And uh, I'm glad that I finally got to introduce myself. <laughs> thanks, Carrie. Thrilled to have you, on, you here and thrilled to have Henrico County uh, Energy Management on board as a partner for the co-op. So um, <clears throat> now to talk about Solar United Neighbors and the solar co-op uh, specifically, uh, just letting you all know, we are Solar United Neighbors, a vendor neutral national 501c3 nonprofit. Uh, we are now operating uh, on the ground in 13 states uh, plus, well, 11 states plus DC and Puerto Rico. Um, and we bring people together to address barriers um, to help with technology, policy, and so much more. Uh, and we represent uh, solar owners and, and potential solar owners. We got our start uh, way back in 2007 uh, in the Mount Pleasant neighborhood of Washington, D.C. Uh, Anya Schoolman, our founder there in the sunglasses in the middle, uh, her son Walter on the left and his friend Diego on the right, uh, came home and said, Mom, you know, we got to go solar. Well, Anya looked into it and quickly found that it was a really uh, confusing and cumbersome process. There was only two solar installers uh, in Washington, D.C. at that time. Uh, they had completely different um, thoughts on permitting process, costs, uh, panels, really even just how to put solar up on a roof. And so uh, Anya and, and her, her son and, and Diego, uh, they got together with their neighbors and, and really kind of uh, worked together to kind of work through the issues of permitting, equipment, and taxes, rules, regulations, uh, on down the list. Um, originally, 100 homes looked into going solar and ultimately 50 homes in the Mount Pleasant neighborhood uh, did end up going solar in a group, uh, and that led to some press attention. Uh, the press started calling, so folks wanted wanted to do that in their neighborhood. So um, Solar United Neighbors really organically began in, in that fashion. Uh, it became a, a full-time job, so Anya quit her day job and uh, has been running Solar United, Solar United Neighbors ever since. Um, now we have solar uh, homeowners and champions in all 50 states. Uh, we've run probably about 400 solar co-ops, uh, and, and bulk purchase programs. And uh, we have over 50 staff across five time zones. So the four contiguous time zones in the U.S. plus Atlantic time uh, in Puerto Rico. Um, we've helped 8,000 families, over 8,000 families go solar uh, across the country. And here in Virginia, uh, we specifically helped over 1,200 families and we're at about 10 uh, megawatts uh, of installed solar uh, on rooftops and ground mounts here just across the Commonwealth and about 70 megawatts across the country. Uh, that's the equivalent to a um, kind of a, a utility scale size of solar farm that we have helped facilitate uh, again across the country. Uh, additionally, we're working towards a new energy system that everyone can participate in, uh, one that's fair and equitable. Uh, here's our organizational vision or our theory of change. Again, we are a 501c3 nonprofit uh, we help folks, first and foremost, go solar. That's kind of what we're doing here tonight. Um, we support people with new and existing technologies. Um, we are installer and technology neutral. Uh, we are not financially invested or, or partners with, with any installer or, or, or panel companies or anything like that. Uh, so really, we're here as a kind of neutral uh, champion for you, a neutral advocate uh, to really educate and empower you as a, as a, as a homeowner that's interested in going solar. Uh, additionally, we join together. So uh, not only do we do what we're doing tonight, but we, uh, we have resources like a uh, Facebook page here in Virginia and a really robust uh, listserv, email listserv, and I'll ask Roger to drop those into the chat. Um, additionally, we help uh, solar homeowners connect with one another, with one another whether that's virtually, um, we do happy hours uh, in, uh, across the, the Commonwealth on occasion. Uh, we had some in, in Hampton Roads earlier this year and in Northern Virginia. Uh, we'll be doing one uh, in Richmond, I'm sure, next year. Usually we do that upon completion of the installations of a solar co-op. Um, and then finally, we help fight for energy rights. Uh, often that's done at the General Assembly here in Richmond. Uh, but on the local level, we'll do that as well. Uh, we really work to spearhead some permitting reforms up in Prince William County, which uh, have taken some significant steps forward, which we're really proud of, although certainly continuing to monitor that work. Uh, also work federally uh, and help partner on passing the Inflation Reduction Act and, and other things coming out of Congress in Washington, D.C. 
And then as we kind of create that, uh, that kind of uh, legal and regulatory pathway for more folks to go solar, uh, the cycle continues. And just letting you know what we're going to cover today, we're going to talk briefly about how solar co-ops work. Uh, we'll talk about the economics of, of going solar. And then the, the chunk, uh, the final chunk will be about solar technology, batteries, and electric vehicle chargers. Uh, I'll take a quick break uh, or a quick pause. Uh, Roger, if there's any questions in the chat, uh, feel free to let me know. Otherwise, I'll just keep rolling. Okay, good, good to go on. Thanks. All right, thanks. So solar co-ops. Um, at its most basic, it is a voluntary buying group that leverages discounts. Uh, it's really the best value on installation. Our job is to give you the tools to make an informed decision. So we're here to, again, educate and empower you on, on what it takes to go solar. Um, we are here to support you throughout that process, whether you go solar with the co-op, whether you want to go solar on your own. Uh, we, will, uh, we will kind of do what we can to help inform you uh, to make the best decision for you and your family. Um, we also help, help you, again, connect with fellow solar enthusiasts, become part of a growing movement. Really important to know there is no obligation to go solar. Joining the co-op is free. It's really just like putting your name in the, in the hopper, so to speak. Um, it's also important to know that the co-op has a beginning and an end uh, and the co-op pricing that we'll be securing through our RFP process uh, is of limited duration. It should be uh, going on. I think the co-op closes on December 12th, I believe. So we still got several months where the co-op is open, but you do need to uh, join the co-op again, no obligation and free uh, by December 12th to kind of throw your hat in the ring. The overall process here, we're kind of in the early stages, month one and two, uh, where we're educating folks, uh, helping them learn about the co-op. We will be selecting the installer once we have critical mass. Uh, usually we're looking for about 30 folks in the group, uh, and then we will convene a voluntary committee made up of, of you if you want to be in there. Whoever volunteers uh, that's part of the co-op has the opportunity to spend a few hours really digging through uh, the various responses. We have the, the, the bids we get from solar installers uh, here in central Virginia. Uh, the choice is up to you, you and, and your fellow uh, solar co-op participants. Uh, we will be kind of facilitating that process, helping explain what things are, uh, but ultimately it, it, it's your decision for you and, and the other co-op members. Uh, and that'll probably take place maybe in about a month or something like that. Uh, and then as we kind of wrap it up, as I mentioned, um, December 12th will be the sign-up deadline. Um, you, once we have an installer selected, you will get a proposal from that installer. Uh, ultimately, you will have 30 days to decide whether or not you want to go uh, forward, uh, whether, you want, whether or not you want to get solar. And that contract will be between you and the solar installer. Uh, and then the installation will take place. Uh, I would imagine right now installations would be scheduled for uh, 2024. Uh, the great news, and we can talk about this a little bit later, is, is the tax credits, as Andrew mentioned, the 30% tax credit uh, is, is the same this year as it is next year. So there's no, no rush to get the install in uh, by the end of uh, the calendar year. And then, as I mentioned, we'll have a party uh, probably in the spring or the summer uh, here in Metro Richmond once all the uh, installations are complete. And then also talk about the economics of solar. I know this is a really important uh, factor for many folks in terms of going solar. Uh, I do like to look at, at solar as a, a great economic investment, first and foremost, and, and think of it as uh, owning your electricity rather than renting it from your electric utility. Um, you know, the cost have dropped significantly since the, the, even 2010. Uh, you do need to view solar as a long-term investment. Uh, the expected lifespan of your solar array is 25 years at least. Uh, there's no moving parts, uh, not really a lot that can fail. Um, it's a great way to hedge against rising utility rates. Generally, utility rates rise 2 to 3% a year, uh, although last year with the, um, you know, the, the natural gas spikes in the war in Ukraine, et cetera, uh, I think uh, prices rose 8 or 9%. And so, uh, you know, that didn't take place for solar owners. Uh, the price of sunshine did not increase. Uh, we're finding that the return on investment in Virginia, I think this is actually a, a little bit of an overestimate. I think it's more around eight to 10 years, eight to 12 years, but even nine to 13 uh, for a 25 year uh, investment of 25 year lifespan of your solar array, paying that off in, in less than half the time is, is certainly a, a tremendous a financial endeavor. Uh, and then once you've paid it off, you're really just getting free electricity. 
And what we do, what the solar co-op does is it really helps reduce the soft costs for a solar installer. That's how we're able to kind of uh, get these prices uh, is that we're able to kind of bring the group together and bring these folks to the solar installer. And so uh, that's where there, we really provide our value. Um, I do also want to look at an example pricing. Um, there's a whole lot of numbers here and I don't want you to get lost in the numbers because really it's every proposal is going to be specific for you. You will get a specific proposal from the solar installer based on your home and your needs and the number of panels that can fit on your roof and all that sort of stuff. But let's look at the right-hand column, which is 8KW. That's about the average system size here uh, in Virginia for residential solar. Uh, we've got an average price per watt uh, of $2.75. And we'll talk more about that a little bit later. Um, but that's turnkey price, so $22,000. It's not like buying a car where there's all these uh, extra fees and, and extra things you have to buy. It's, this is turnkey, this is permits. This is everything uh, all in $22,000. Um, there is a 30% federal tax credit. Um, we have that factoring at 6,600. Very important to note, uh, you must have federal tax liability in order to, to take advantage of this tax credit. It is not a refund. Uh, not everybody uh, gets it. So uh, if you're not sure whether or not you have you know, $6,600 a year, and, and federal tax liability you should speak with a financial advisor. Uh, you can roll it over for, I think, up to five years uh, if, if you need to do that. But you again, really important, federal tax liability. This is not state stuff, but, but federal. Uh, and so we have the net cost there at just over $15,000. And so that's the total cost. And then in terms of how the, the solar array pays you back, uh, there's two main components. One is the amount of money you're going to save on your electricity bill. Now, I'm not going to say that your electricity bill will go away. Uh, for me, as an example, I have a, about a 5KW system, uh, an old house. It's probably not very efficient. Uh, I've got electric vehicles. i got kids. Um, we, it doesn't, you know, we, we cover 50 to 60% of our electricity usage. So I still have a bill, uh, but the solar really offsets it. So some people will have, you know, 100% offset. All the, the solar will cover all their usage and, and others will not. Um, but your savings... Uh, we have a conservatively estimated eleven hundred dollars in a year, uh, and again, that's not a linear path. So it's a, a just about twelve thousand dollars after ten years, uh, and so the lifetime is is over thirty two thousand dollars for twenty five years in electricity savings. Uh, plus, there's something called a solar renewable energy credit. Um, this is really a credit you as a, a renewable energy producer. Uh, in the Commonwealth of Virginia that has value. Uh, and so you can you can take credit for your solar production and, and take it to market kind of like Wall Street, right? And uh, there's about four brokers uh, here in Virginia, different companies that will sell those credits uh, on the market uh, and you can generate uh, revenue, uh, you know, several hundred dollars of revenue a year, uh, depending on the size of your system. It's based on the production. So the larger your system, uh, the more uh, SREX you will produce. And we have that estimated for an 8KW system at, at $9,000 a year. And you can see the net profit right there is $26,000 um, after 25 years. So again, don't want you to get lost in the numbers. Just want you to understand how this, how this, what it costs, which again is, is total price uh, with a 30% federal tax credit. And then the way you pay it back is on energy savings, electricity savings, plus SREX. And we have an SREC guide. We, uh, I'll have Roger drop that in the chat. Uh, you can you can dig really deep uh, into SREX. Uh, also, both our Facebook page and our email listserv are, are a great resource for uh, asking more questions about SREX. As I mentioned, the federal tax credit uh, is continuous at 30%. It used to be decreasing to where it was going to be zero next year. Um, but thanks to the Inflation Reduction Act, uh, it is 30% for the next 10 years. <clears throat> In terms of how to pay for a solar array, obviously cash is the easiest way, uh, but many people do not have uh, that kind of cash lying around. And so if you need to finance a, a system, uh, there's a variety of ways you can do it. Obviously you can get a home equity line of credit or refinance uh, your home and include solar. You can get a traditional loan from your bank. Um, there's also financing through uh, the solar installer. Uh, that's a very common way to finance a system or there's actually a handful of credit unions that's uh, specifically focused on solar and other renewable energy products, green energy products like EVs, whatnot. That's the Clean Energy Credit Union and the Community First Credit Union. 
And then additionally, if you qualify as low income, uh, we do have a great financing option. Uh, our partner, Ruth Amundsen, uh, with Sunspots and Norfolk Solar uh, can walk you through all this. Uh, last year, she did one of these uh, low income installations as part of our co-op in Hampton Roads. And we're thrilled to have her partnering with us for the first time uh, in Richmond. So Ruth, I will turn it over to you. All right, hi everybody. My name is Ruth Amundsen. I run Norfolk Solar and Sunspots, which are small LLCs that finance home solar in low wealth areas. And the way it works is I buy the solar and I own it. It gets installed on your home. And we write an agreement between us. I write one page power purchase agreements. They're very simple. That basically says I own the solar. I get to take the tax credits. And over the, le over the term of our agreement, which is usually about eight years, you will pay me for the electricity it generates um, at the same price that you buy electricity from Dominion. And it can be adjusted um, to be slightly less than that for a longer time. Um, but basically, a lot of people that have less income can't take the tax credit. So this is a way to still have a low payoff time. Um, because I'm owning the system and taking the tax credits. I've done six homes so far in Hampton Roads. I'm the only one in Virginia that does um, financing of homes with power purchase agreements, um, but it's no money out of pocket to you and you'll own the system in about eight or 10 years. Um, and I'm happy to do that. And we're hoping to get a lot of homes in Richmond through this program and hoping to do some more um, outreach that would be specific to neighborhoods that might benefit from it. Um, I'll tell you a different program that I don't run, and Ben, stop me if you have a slide on this. Um, Dominion actually has a, a program where if you qualify via both age and income, you have to meet a certain income limit and you have to be at least 60, they will do an entire um, energy audit of your home and come in and weatherize it. A friend of mine had two feet of insulation blown into his attic and got new LED bulbs. And now they're putting four kilowatts of solar on his house. And all that is completely free to him. Um, it does take a while to go through the paperwork. Um, I'm going to drop the site for that in the chat. And I'll also drop Norfolk Solar's um, site in the chat. But that can be another way to get the energy efficiency upgrades and also get solar. Um, but I'll be happy to do as many homes as come forward for financing as part of this co-op. Um, and I will say that although it's uh, in Virginia, people have to qualify as low income for me to be able to do a power purchase agreement, but it's not that low in income. It's based on how many people are in the house. Uh, but basically it's an annual taxable income for a household of four, it would be $79,000 a year. So if you're in a household of four and you make less than $79,000 a year, then you would qualify. Um, so it's not it's not that limiting. Uh, and I've done, like I said, I've done six homes. And um, if somebody wants to do it, I'm happy to put in, in contact with people whose homes I've already put on solar to make sure that they can talk to a satisfied customer and make sure that they um, will be happy with, with what, what happens. And I'm going to drop some of those sites in the chat and happy to answer questions. Um, so there's a question in there about what if you need to sell your home um, as you age. And uh, if it is, say, 10 years, then the agreement would be over. And so um, uh, you would just be selling the home with the solar on it. Um, if you do need to sell your home while the solar is on it, there's basically two options. You can sell it with the power purchase agreement intact, so the new owner would have to also pay for the solar that's generated, but there you'll have a lower electricity bill from Dominion. So you're basically just using your savings on your Dominion bill to pay the Sunspots bill. Um, and then the other option is if you have enough, um, you can just buy out the remaining payments and then uh, have the solar free and clear. Thanks Ruth. Yep. And yeah, if you have more questions, again, feel free to, to drop them in the chat. Uh, I'm sure Ruth's contact information is there as well. Um, and worst case, you can always reach out to us here at Solar Nine Neighbors. And we're happy to, to put you in touch with Ruth. Yeah. And just so you know, I do have to leave at about five minutes before the hour. So um, I won't be able to answer questions after that. But Ben has seen what I do, so he can probably answer most of those. Absolutely. Great. All right. Well, we'll keep rolling then. Um, 
and wanted to talk about solar technology to make sure that you understand, you know, what solar is, how it fits on your roof and uh, all that sort of stuff. So at its most basic, we're talking about photo photovoltaic PV, uh, solar PV converts solar energy to electricity. Um, that's the majority of what today's market is. You might hear something about solar thermal, uh, which is, you know, can be good for heating a pool or something like that. But that's that's not what we're talking about and not what we're uh, doing with the, the solar co-op. Um, the way the panels work, um, you know, mostly what I want you to see is that the solar cell is really well protected here uh, by the, the glass and the, the other uh, features there. And so um, they're really, uh, you know, wind and rain resistant, even hail resistant. Uh, and, and so the panels are they, they last a long time. Uh, once you have more than uh, one panel, it's called a solar array. Uh, um, also, another thing, important thing to note is that panels generate electricity in DC or direct current. Uh, some important terminology we have uh, is KW or kilowatt. Uh, your system will be measured in KW. So when you get a proposal from a solar installer, uh, they'll certainly tell you how many panels you're going to have. But most importantly, you want to know how many KW is it. Uh, that's where the, the price comes in. As I mentioned, 8KW uh, is the most common uh, system size here in Virginia. Uh, most systems are kind of between 5KW and 15KW. Once you get over 15KW, uh, and you can legally, you can go up to 25KW on, on a residence here in Virginia um, in Dominion territory. But uh, once you go over 15KW, you are subject to a demand charge, uh, which can cost a, a fair bit of money every month and is generally something you want to avoid if at all possible. Uh, KW and the kilowatts, the wattage is really kind of a measurement of the overall power. Uh, that's the kind of the, the total generating capacity potential, I should really say, uh, of your array. Uh, a kilowatt hour, KWH, is the measurement of electricity over a period of time, in this case, an hour. Uh, where KWH is really going to come in handy is going to be on your electricity bill. So if you look at your bill from Dominion uh, or your electricity provider, you will see your monthly bill in, in KWH. You know, maybe it was a, a thousand KWH or something like that last month. Um, and there actually be the last 12 months of usage will be on your bill. Uh, and so that's a great way to determine uh, how much you use in a year. Um, as I mentioned, the average system size, I think it's a little bit larger, seven or eight right now, KW, uh, but it doesn't have to be uh, a, a full 100% offset. As I mentioned, you know, I cover 50 to 60% of my use. Uh, nothing wrong with that. It depends on your budget. Uh, it depends on what, you know, what, how much electricity you use in a year. Uh, there's no, no kind of rule like, oh, I have a 2,000 square foot house. How much electricity do I need? Or how much, how many solar panels do I need? Well, much more important questions are, you know, how's, how's your energy efficiency? How's your insulation? How many people live in the house, right? Or do they run hot or cold? Or, or do, you, do you have electric heat or do you have gas heat? Do you have an electric vehicle? All these factors will determine uh, how much electricity you're going to use in a year, uh, more so than just the square footage of your home. Uh, one final thing I wanted to show here in the, uh, the, the diagram here, the image, um, this is 12 solar panels. Let's say they were 300 watts, which is pretty small nowadays, but 300 watt panels, you had 12 of them. So that would be 3.6 kW. Uh, additionally, you could have 400 watt panels and you wouldn't have nine of them also would be 3.6 kW. So again, it doesn't really matter how many panels you have. I mean, certainly it depends on how much you can, how much space you have you can fit. But in terms of what you really want to know is the KW, that's kind of the, the horsepower, the power production potential you have uh, on your roof there. Uh, the system components, um, really nowadays on, on residential systems, it's either string inverters with a DC optimizer or a micro inverter. The inverters sit under the panel. Uh, they're really kind of the brains of the, uh, the solar array. And what they do, most importantly, perhaps, is they, they convert the electricity from DC, as I mentioned, the solar panel generates in DC, and they convert it to AC, or alternating current, because your home runs on alternating current. And so in order to condition the, the electricity for use in your home, uh, that's where the inverters come in. Additionally, they're in constant communication with the grid. Uh, if there's ever a grid outage or any kind of grid, uh, you know, grid disruption, uh, your microinverters will be aware of that. Uh, and, and really interestingly enough, nowadays you can get an app 
on your phone, uh, it'll become one of your, your new favorite toys. And you can look at it and you can see the production of, of each panel on your roof, you know, from your couch. Uh, and that's a great way to troubleshoot, right? If somehow, uh, A, you're kind of tracking your, your production every day uh, and you notice one day that somehow production's down, you know, not because of the sun or something like that, but, but, but you can't figure it out. You can go and look on your app and see like, oh, panels number seven is no longer producing. That's a great, you know, that's when you're calling a service technician or what, what have you, uh, it's great to know that information. That's a, ra a rarity that that would happen, but uh, it is a kind of an important thing to know. Uh, once you've got your panels figured out and your inverter figured out, you need to get the, the panels uh, up on your roof, and that's where you're going to have a racking system. Uh, this is an asphalt shingle roof, which is the most common roof type we have here in Virginia. Um, and then additionally, you can get a you can put solar on a standing seam metal roof or also a rubber membrane roof. Uh, as Andrew mentioned at the top, slate roofs are no good for solar. Uh, they're really fragile. Uh, and so most uh, the, the installation is really complex. And so most solar installers will not work on slate. Another com important component of your solar uh, installation is your electrical panel. Uh, the panel, the solar array will, there'll be conduit, uh, whether it's uh, through your attic or something like that, or on the side of your house uh, and connect to your electrical panel. Uh, the installer, one of the first things they'll do is ask to see a photo of your electrical panel, because uh, they're going to determine, do you have space uh, to, to put kind of a 240, a two pole breaker in your electrical panel uh, and to handle this load? Uh, most homes uh, do not need a, a system upgrade, uh, but if you do, your, your installer will be able to figure that out. Uh, the great news is you usually can get that through the co-op uh, and electrical panel upgrades are also uh, have federal tax credits uh, available. In terms of determining what's a good roof for solar, uh, it's more of an art than a science. Um, the first and foremost is, is the roof orientation. That's what direction the roof faces. We're in the Northern Hemisphere, so ideally you want to face towards the equator. Uh, so south facing a roof is, is best, uh, but most people don't have a south facing roof. Uh, west also work, works really well. You have that great afternoon sun. Uh, even west by northwest can work. Uh, and east works just fine, uh, that, that sun in the morning. Kind of the one direction you want to avoid is, is northerly facing. Uh, additionally, you want to have little or no shading, especially during those peak production times, kind of 10 a.m. to 3 p.m. or so. Uh, you need to have enough space to mount panels uh, free of dormers and gables and chimneys and that sort of stuff. Uh, and you don't need a new roof, but you do want to have a newer roof uh, that's largely uh, free of damage. Uh, if you don't have a good roof for whatever reason and you have the space, it's usually hard to do in the city, Richmond, uh, but maybe if you're out in the surrounding counties, you might have a, a bit more space in your yard. Uh, you could get a ground-mounted system. Uh, one of the great benefits about a ground-mounted system is, is you can determine what direction it's going to face. So your roof might face north, but you could have a, a, a ground-mounted system facing south. Um, but there is uh, more cost to that. So you're, you're getting increased solar production, uh, but you've got a bit more cost. You can see there's a rack here that had to be created, right? So that's uh, labor and, and parts to create that rack, whereas when it's being mounted to your roof, uh, the roof serves as the rack itself. And then additionally, they're going to need to trench some, uh, some conduit uh, into your yard, and, and that certainly has a, a cost to it. We really don't recommend more than usually about 50 to 100 feet of trenching uh, from your uh, electrical meter, because uh, that's uh, that's where your your solar is ultimately going to be to be run. Some of the frequently asked questions we get: uh, warranties. Uh, again, these are 25 year expected lifespan um, for solar panels. Uh, that's really kind of the industry standard nowadays. Uh, manufacturer defect, you know, uh, could be 10 to 25 years. That's something that doesn't affect the production. That might be like a, a piece of metal hanging off the side or something like that. Uh, the inverters usually are 10 to 25 year warranty. Uh, and then there'll be a workmanship warranty from the installer. Uh, that could be, you know, three to 10 years. And that could be something like a conduit run or roof penetration. Uh, in terms of homeowner's insurance, uh, the solar becomes part of your home, so certainly encourage you to call your insurance company, uh, let them know that you are considering going solar. Uh, we found that the industry standard is either that solar will uh, not, you know, not increase your premiums or it'll increase slightly. Uh, if by some reason your insurer quotes you a significant increase, we, we encourage you to shop around 
because uh, that is not the industry standard. Um, these are really maintenance free. Again, kind of no moving parts. You don't need to clear snow uh, off your panels. We get uh, plenty of rain, so you can let the rain clean your panels. Um, hail, they are hail resistant. As I mentioned, you got the online monitoring with your app. Um, they last about 25 years. Um, will HOA allow solar in my home? Um, you know, the great news again, through our kind of our fighting for energy rights at the General Assembly a few years ago, uh, we helped it and more challenging. We helped make it more challenging for HOAs to uh, put on unreasonable restrictions on you for, for going solar. Uh, that's not to say that, that every HOA covenant uh, grants you the right to go solar, but certainly uh, much more of them do nowadays than, than previously. And if you're in a historic district, uh, like parts of Richmond, uh, I encourage you to talk to the installer. Uh, they have a lot of experience working with uh, the juris various jurisdictions on, on permitting. Roger, we have any questions before I keep moving? Yes, we have a couple of questions. Um, so one question is, uh, Suzanne wanted to know about the materials and solar panels and issues about various manufacturers. I think, you know, particularly, obviously, there's a lot of, you know, press about different uh, manufacturers, you know, using different, um, you know, using forced labor in Xinjiang and China. So I want to see if you, you want to, you can address that. I can also give uh, my answer as well. Um, and then, yeah, we have a cu couple um, other ones as well. Yeah, well, you feel free to go for it on that one. You're, you're probably tracking that more than I am. Yeah, um, I mean, the, obviously, we we hear all these all these stories, and you know, I know the government is definitely uh, you know working on cutting down on that. There are also the um, right now there are you know pretty big um, you know excise taxes on importing solar panels from China because of like trade war disputes and stuff like that. But uh, we definitely see as part of our co-ops that a lot of folks really do want materials that are manufactured in North America. Um, you know, and do, and want to make sure that they're you know steering away as much as possible from a lot of those supply chains. So, um, you know, Andrew, also feel feel free to chime in. But I think because of that, we definitely have seen a lot of uh, installers for our co-ops, and I'm sure outside of co-ops too, um, want to usually provide a bunch of options. So, um, you know, most of them do you know are not um, Chinese made. I mean, I'm sure there are some components there. But um, I, I see a lot of um, panels made in America now uh, because of the Inflation Reduction Act and the incentives to do that. And also a lot of panels just made in North America, like Silfab is a big manufacturer that's often, um, you know, used in, in co-ops and offered in Mission Solar. Mission Solar is Amer American made. Silfab um, is in, I think, Washington State and also in Canada. And then, um, yeah, and there there are some panels made in Minnesota as well that we that we tend to see offered. So you know there are definitely options. Um, I think most installers usually have at least two or three options, and they'll always have at least one American or North American made option um, because that's a very common concern. Um, yeah, I I just chime in that I mean <laughs> there are increasingly. Uh, U.S. manufacturers because of um, trade policies, you know, our industrial policy, uh, both of this administration and interestingly of the previous. Um, and uh, it's, so that's good. There are more and more U.S. made options. Um, and, and it's important to consider uh, the overall net benefits of going solar compared to you know the the fossil fuel consumption, the other things. I mean, to my mind, it, it, it's it's something to consider, and if you can optimize when you go solar, but don't let it stand in the way of going solar, because I think the net benefits of solar uh, outweigh uh, some of the downsides of those other issues. Not to not, and that was not meant to downplay it, but just to say that we're in a complicated world. Yeah. I think, as, as Roger mentioned, I, I generally, I think every every installer that bids on the co-op, and we usually ask for one, uh, a North American made, you know, whether it's U.S. or Canada uh, option, because it's certainly something that uh, a chunk of folks, you know, is, is a priority for them. And so um, kind of the way that the co-op works to, to some extent is, 
it, it's almost like a catering menu. You know, if you were to go to a, a wedding or something like that, where you'd have chicken and fish and vegetarian. So it might, you know, it's not that you can get any panel you want that that is out there, but they're going to have maybe three options on panels uh, and maybe a couple different inverter options. Uh, you know, so you can kind of pick and choose from that kind of uh, co-op menu, so to speak. Uh, and it, we we see North American options. It's an important piece for for enough folks uh, that we specifically ask for it. Uh, don't require it, but but certainly request it. Um, and, and more often than not, uh, that'll be a part of the every everyone's proposal. Um, I also have a, a question uh, from Ron about uh, selling a solar home. Um, and, you know, uh, Ruth had covered a little bit for, you know, uh, for a lease um, or a PPA option. But Ben, if you could talk a little bit about, you know, if you have solar panels on your roof, how that impacts uh, selling your home if you own the panels. Yeah. So if you own the panels outright, you know, it's just like anything else you, you might have done with your home. Um, it's, it's part of the home that you do sell. We, we are seeing, uh, I, I don't have any articles, uh, you know, at my fingertips, but we're certainly seeing that that solar uh, helps increase the value of, of homes. Uh, people are starting to recognize that more and more. I think it, it's helpful to use a, a real estate agent uh, that, that is aware of that and kind of can speak that language and, and market it appropriately. Because if you do have solar panels, uh, that have, you know, 10, 15 years of lifespan left, uh, that's a significant cost savings to uh, to the, the future homeowner uh, in terms of ele electricity bills. And so um, we're seeing it more and more as being a, a, fe a feature in, in the kind of the real estate market. Um, and so certainly if you own the panels outright, um, it, it's, a, it's a great thing. If you still have, you know, loan payment on them, then similar to what, what Ruth was saying is, you know, you can, you can you can attempt to kind of convey that to the the next owner, and that would be you know just like anything else, you you would need to negotiate between the two of you, or you could use kind of the the you know the the once you sell your home, you could use that that capital uh, to kind of pay off the remainder of the loan, uh, so that the new owner didn't have uh, payments uh, but also benefited. So again, I think the the short answer is is solar in general increases the value of a home. Um, but you just want to make sure that you have uh, somebody that, that knows how to kind of promote that and speak that language when when selling your home. Thanks so much. And also just uh, in the chat, there's been a little bit of a conversation. Uh, James was saying that a bunch of people in the Richmond area had had uh, solar installed and had roof leaks. Is that normal or is it a bad installer? So um, there's just been a little bit of conversation about that. And yeah, um, I would just throw in that, you know, roof leaks, um, I've definitely, you know, we've all heard of them, but it's very not, you know, not common. And um, you know, Andrew, Andrew chimed in and Grayson chimed in as well about that. And yeah, I, in my experience, the good installers really, really know what they're doing and, you know, make sure that they are using the most up-to-date methodology and, and do not have any roof leaks. Um, so I think that's definitely one example of just like checking references, checking online reviews, you know, checking Better Business Bureau ratings and just making sure that, you know, even if you go solar outside of the co-op, which we're happy to help you with as well, just that you're, um, you know, really doing your homework and making sure that the company, you know, has worked in the area. That's right. Yeah, I mean, it's a big investment. I, I think roof leaks are, are a rarity uh, when, for a good installer. Um, you know, I, I don't know who was doing the installs on all those roof leaks. Um, but yeah, we, we certainly don't find that. It, it, as common at all in the the um, the co-ops that that we're a part of. All right, I'll keep rolling, rolling. I know we got about five minutes to go. Um, just wanted to recap on some important terminology. So uh, in this image right here, we have a solar array. Uh, the, the solar uh, the the electricity generated flows through the inverters, which then ultimately goes to your electrical panel. And your home has the right of first refusal on all that electricity. So your home will be powered. Uh, by as much solar as, as is generated or as is possible uh, at, at any one time. Uh, if there is a surplus uh, of electri solar electricity, so if you're generating so much that you can power everything in your home and have solar left over, then that solar electricity will flow through your utility meter onto the poles and wires, 
which is what we call the grid. Um, and if there's not enough uh, solar electricity generated at any moment, uh, the electricity from the poles and wires from your electrical utility will actually flow through your meter in a in the opposite direction and, and supplement the, the solar electricity uh, from your, your panels. And then you'll have uh, electricity from the poles and wires. And every, every instant you will get the exact amount of electricity you need to power your home. Um, and this is what's called net metering, right? So the, the it's net of the amount of, of electricity that flows onto the grid, onto the poles and wires uh, versus what you are pulling off of the poles and wires. And so at the end of the month, and then ultimately at the end of the year, uh, you look at that as what is the net uh, usage? Uh, is it a positive, is it a negative? And that's uh, how your, your bill is, is calculated ultimately. So this is a really basic uh, uh, look at net metering. Uh, the important thing to know, it is a one-to-one -one credit. So uh, for every kind of electron that you are putting, every kWh, every kilowatt hour, you're putting on to the grid, you're receiving the, the, the same value uh, for that electricity as you are when you're pulling it off the grid from Dominion. Obviously, there's there's daily and seasonal surpluses. Uh, as I mentioned, ultimately, you'll be looking at it on an annual billing cycle. Um, and, and we do have a net energy metering guide uh, that I'll have uh, Roger uh, put in the chat. Um, but it's really important to note that the net metering uh, and the one-to-one -one credit is a really critical tool uh, for solar, uh, having this, this fair credit. Uh, and here's kind of a really basic effect of how it work, affects your electricity bill. Let's say you consume 300 kilowatt hours, which is a, a very low number, uh, but just for simplicity's sake, if you consume 300 kilowatt hours and you produce 250 kilowatt hours from your solar array, doesn't matter where those are consumed, uh, you know, whether it's in your home or on the grid, uh, the, the, the difference is you kind of pulled 50 kilowatt hours uh, from the grid uh, at, at any one point in time. So your bill would be 50 kilowatt hours uh, once you have solar, whereas right now it would have been 300. A um, couple other important notes, uh, even if you are generating 100% of electricity and offsetting everything, you will still have what's called a connection charge. Uh, and that's just so you can kind of do this and connect to the grid. Um, in, the, in Dominion Territory, that's $6.58 a month plus tax. So seven, $8 a month uh, to, to kind of have the, the grid uh, there whenever you need it. Um, surpluses can be carried over month to month. So often we see surpluses in the spring and the fall when you're not really using your HVAC as much. Those are kind of the biggest electricity hogs in your home, uh, along with perhaps an EV if you have one of those. Uh, and so you can kind of have a, a surplus, almost like the old rollover minutes in, in the springtime where you have some good sunshine, uh, but you're not really using your AC or your heat. And then as you roll into summer, uh, you might be cranking that, that AC so much that you're not quite generating a surplus, even though the sun is shining a lot. Um, and you can kind of dwindle that surplus down and then build it back up in the fall. And then in the winter, when the days are shorter, uh, and you're not generating as much, you can, again, dwindle that, that surplus down. So that's how it works uh, on an annual basis. Um, another important thing to note is that when Dominion looks at your, your anniversary date or your annual date, uh, it is not January 1. Uh, it's going to be based on whatever date you received PTO, also known as permission to operate. That's, in essence, the day your solar array was turned on. It's not usually the day your solar is installed. Usually it's a, a few weeks, a month after your solar being installed that you would get PTO. So my anniversary date's in November. Yours could be in April. It doesn't really matter, um, but just wanted to flag that, that, that it's not January 1st. And then really quickly about kind of batteries and power outages. Uh, it's a bit counterintuitive. Uh, you might think if you have solar in your home and the power goes out, well, you just get to keep using that solar. Uh, and that is actually not true. Uh, the reason for that is it's a, it's a big safety uh, hazard, right? As I mentioned, if you're generating a surplus solar electricity uh, and then feeding it onto the grid, well, if the, the, the grid is down uh, and then there's somebody working on the lines trying to repair that, uh, they could be electrocuted because your house is sending uh, electricity uh, onto those wires. And so that's where your inverters come in and they're going to be talking to the grid and they will actually automatically shut down and stop generating electricity uh, when they detect an outage. And then once they detect that the grid is back up and running, they will then uh, you know, resume generating solar. So if you do want to have 
uh, access to your solar electricity while the grid is down, you must have a battery. And so what this does is, is you have a, you know, a separate electrical circuit, a closed loop uh, islanding, people call it, to where your solar is powering a battery or storing electricity in a battery. And then that battery is also uh, looping back to your home. Uh, and then you can have access to a limited amount uh, of electricity in your home. Most often, you will not be able to power your entire home, especially kind of those, those big central air and that sort of thing uh, on batteries and a solar array, unless you have a really efficient home or something like that. Um, but good to know that, again, just wanted to point out when the power goes out, uh, you will not have access to uh, your solar um, unless you have a battery. Um, batteries, frankly, are really expensive and, and the supply chain on them is, is pretty challenging. Uh, they're also complex and they have a lot more components. Uh, it can potentially double the, the cost of your solar install. But, you know, there are folks to whom that's, that's uh, you know, irrelevant and they really uh, need a battery. That can be, if you if you live in a place where you, you're kind of, uh, you know, off the, the beaten path, so to speak, and have really frequent outages and it can take a week or whatnot to repair your, your restore your power. Uh, if you have a critical loaded home, like a well pump or or medical equipment that you really can't live without, you might you might uh, view battery as a necessity. If you work in an emergency or disaster preparedness, something like that. Um, so again, it, uh, it's great to have, uh, but they're they're pretty expensive and, and they're complex. So just wanted to flag that as, as something for folks. If you want to know more about batteries, uh, we've got a whole uh, webinar. We've got a guide. I'll have Roger drop it in the chat um, and, and uh, all sorts of stuff. So a couple more slides and then we're going to finish it up. I uh, did want to announce also that as part of the co-op, you can get an electric vehicle charger. Uh, you know, that way you're really driving on, on sunshine, so to speak. Uh, if you are going to get a charger, it would be a level two charger, which is kind of a home-based fast charger. Uh, so not a, a not a, a not a, a super not a high speed charger like you might see uh, at a gas station or on the side of the highway or something like that. But a standard level two charger at home uh, does require another 240 volt outlet. Um, usually uh, there's warranties for up to three years. Uh, and if you're thinking about getting a charger. Uh, some things to think about ahead of time is where you're going to have it. You know, is it going to be inside, outside, uh, wall-mounted, pedestal? Uh, do you have uh, electrical service capability? As I mentioned, you're going to need, you know, that, that 240 uh, breaker in your electrical panel, about 30 to 50 amps. Um, <clears throat> you know, how far away is your electrical panel from where your charger is going to be? Uh, just like we talked about with the ground-mounted system earlier, if folks are having to run a whole bunch of conduit or if they have to punch through a bunch of walls, there's, that's going to be more cost to install that, that EV charger. Uh, whereas if, let's say, it's in your garage, you have an electrical panel in your garage and you want to put your EV charger in the garage, that's, that's a pretty uh, easy install as well. Um, and what do you do next? Uh, I certainly encourage you to, to join the solar co-op. Uh, tell your family and friends. Uh, also stay tuned for the RFP phase. As I mentioned, uh, that's the request for proposals. We'll be putting that out, I imagine, in a, a number of weeks and probably convening a selection committee in, you know, in a month, four to six weeks, something like that, uh, once we have critical mass. Uh, and you can help speed that process up by, again, joining the co-op and, and letting your friends and family know. It's open to the entire re Metro Richmond. There's no really hard line on that. It's not just Henrico and 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 uh, Richmond, Chesterfield, Goochland, Hanover, you know, really wherever wherever the solar installer will go, uh, kind of on a standard uh, standard uh, install, uh, they're they're part of the co-op. So if you could get a a plumber, an electrician to come to your house, as as kind of generally that works in Richmond, uh, you would be kind of part of the Richmond co-op. So uh, the website is there, um, and again, we want you to be a smart consumer. Uh, we are here to educate and empower you. Uh, you can join the Facebook group and the Virginia Listserv uh, as well. Just want to say thank you. Here is our email address. You can email the group of us at VA team, VA like Virginia, VA team at solarunitedneighbors.org. Uh, and I'll pause one more time, Roger, to see if there's any uh, final questions in the chat. Yeah, I had one last question about the uh, Dominion time of use plans. If you could talk a little bit about that. I can I can talk a little bit. I'm I'm definitely not a, an expert. Um, so time of use plans. So time of use is at its most basic is where you pay a different 
price for electricity depending on the time of day. You know, so that might be like midnight to 5 a.m. Is, is, is cheap electricity, cheaper. Uh, and then kind of in the morning and then there's a noon time. And then the most expensive usually is that late afternoon, like 3 to 7 p.m. or something like that. Uh, and so if you had solar and you had batteries and you wanted to do time of use, you could kind of never pull electricity from the grid, ideally, uh, during those expensive times, like 3 to 7 p.m. Uh, you've got sunshine, you've got your batteries, and you're able to supply your house with that. And then maybe you're refilling your batteries at, at after midnight. Um, in order to do that, you also probably want to have a lot of smart appliances. Uh, you want to be able to charge your car uh, after midnight, right? But you're not going to want to plug it in at midnight. You want to plug it in and have it automatically start to charge after midnight, your dishwasher, maybe your dryer, other things like that. And so you're kind of, you're you're playing the system a little bit where you, you are paying different prices depending on the time of day. It's complicated, requires a lot of work, uh, but, it, but it can be beneficial if you have batteries. Uh, they had a pilot program, I think it was about 10,000 folks that have been in it for a number of years. And, and I believe just this year they, they uh, expanded that, maybe another 10,000 or something. I'm not totally sure uh, on the specifics. Um, Andrew, I don't know if you know much more than that about the time of use program. It's Again, it's in the pilot phase. Uh, there's there's places uh, in other parts of the country that are a little more uh, advanced, but it's it's pretty complicated, pretty involved. But if that's something that that uh, strikes your fancy, it might be uh, worth looking into. Yeah, and I dropped in a link uh, higher up the chat to Dominion's program. Uh, if you have a smart meter, you can log in. It's, um, and I, I, you know, the key question is, well, can I save money doing it? And will solar, I mean, if you have batteries and solar, yes, they will help you optimize. I've got a good friend who's a 10 times the energy nerd I am, and he gives it a solid meh. Uh, you know, he worked kind of hard to save some money and like save a few bucks. Um, it all comes down to the degree, you know, what are what's the difference in the rates at the different times. Um, but the uh, website I shared, it does have a nice, very simple breakdown. There's of, uh, of when electricity is more expensive and when it's cheaper. And in all cases, all seasons, um, all days of, of the week, uh, uh, electricity is cheaper from 12 a.m. to 5 a.m. Uh, so that's the time you can set your timer on your car or the charger to charge then. And that's obviously not the time a solar array would be producing. So to that degree, it, it certainly matches the production and consumption patterns that you can, uh, for a home with, with solar and or an EV, can set itself to. Great. Thanks, Andrew. Um, Roger, unless there's any final questions, uh, I will just say thank you to everybody for joining. Thank you to Andrew with Viridian and Dawn with the City of Richmond and Carrie with Henrico County and Ruth Amundsen with uh, Norfolk Solar and Sunspots. Uh, and also thank you to Roger for running the chat uh, and, and being here. Um, really appreciate all of you for, for taking you know a little over an hour out of your evening and joining us. And again, uh, I encourage you to spread the word far and wide about the Metro Richmond Solar Co-op. Uh, we've also got one open in Hampton Roads. If you have any friends or family, uh, you know, uh, out in, in that uh, region of, of the Commonwealth, out in Tidewater, um, got two of these going right now and would, would love your help spreading the word. So uh, thank you. And if you have any other questions, feel free to email us again, vateam at solar9neighbors.org. And uh, thanks again. I hope you all have a pleasant evening.